Welcome to part two of our conversation with John Missouri about reggae uh, and the very broad and interesting world of reggae. Welcome again, John. And again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Cole. Pleasure to be with you again. To, to carry on where we were, <laughs> my next question was, um, who was Leslie Kong and what mm -hmm. role did he play with, with the Rollers? with the whalers. <laughs> yes. Um, Leslie Kong, I think, was probably a real highlight of their early career. Uh, we're talking the whalers, Bob, Bunny, and Peter now, because they'd spent, um, they'd spent more than two years at Studio One. They'd made over a hundred recordings. They'd had local hits and um, very little by way of financial return. And then they decided to go it alone. Bob Marley went off to Delaware to spend time with his mother, came back with some money, decided to fund their own label called Whalen Solem. And um, they put out, started putting out some records, uh, which didn't do very well at all. But then they lacked the marketing and the promotion and the distribution um, that was needed to have hits in their own right. They tried uh, recording for a couple of other people, uh, Ted Pounder, you know, from Federal and so on. But Leslie Kong, um, he is probably the most successful reggae producer uh, from Jamaica um, of that early era by a long distance. Um, his stable included Jimmy Cliff, uh, Derek Morgan, Toots and the Maytels, the Melodians, uh, the Pioneers. And a lot of these people had crossover hits in, um, in the UK, most certainly. But also in America, Desmond Decker, Israelites had been a sizable hit. Mm -hmm. And so he was the hit maker. And also he had a shop on the corner of Orange Street and North Parade in downtown Kingston, uh, which was very close to where the Whalers were based. They had a little shop themselves. So I think also we talked in the first part about how Bob Marley um, had made a record before the others, before the other two Whalers, both for Leslie Kong when he was just a, a teenager and uh, Judge Knott and One Cup of Coffee. And although they hadn't been hits either, um, they were his first time in the studio and it was more a, a, a good experience than anything else. So they didn't have an ax to grind with Leslie Kong. He maybe could have offered them a gateway to um, a crossover success. And so they arranged to record an album for him. Now, this was the first time that they'd gone into a situation where they knew they were recording an album that had not happened before. Um, whatever albums came out of the Studio One experience were just put together afterwards. But Leslie Kong, they set out to make an album. It was an absolute crack band. It was crack session musicians. It was the top people of that era, Jackie Jackson, Hux Brown, and so on who played on a lot of the other crossover hits. And um, I think it was uh, the, 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 the hit that came out of that set, those sessions was Soul Shakedown Party. Um, they also had songs like Caution, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Peter Tosh sang lead on a couple of those songs. It was a good album. And uh, I've heard that it was originally supposed to be called Cheer Up after one of Bob Marley's songs, or Caution. And in the end, uh, Leslie Kong um, called it the best of the Whalers, which really upset them <laughs> because they felt the best was yet to come. But from everyone I've spoken to um, about Leslie Kong, they are very, um, they're very complimentary about him. Mm -hmm. He ran this ice cream parlor called Beverly's in Kingston, and uh, but he loved music, he and his brothers. And um, 
they would make sure that the musicians were looked after. They had food, they had drink, they had something to smoke, whatever it was. They had facilities to rehearse properly before they went into the studio. And he also had people on hand like Gladdy Anderson and so on, who were very good musicians. And if a singer was struggling with a, a song or a verse, they could step in and, and actually um, improve the song. So he had everything on his side um, to actually make good records, and he did. Mm -hmm. And I think um, I actually have an audio visual aid. He is in, in this album. Can you, can you see it? Yes. Um, one of the great soundtracks ever recorded. And he is, I think, um, in the, when they have, uh, when they record Pressure Drop, that, that song, is that Toots and the Maytals? Yes, Pressure it Drop. Is. And mm -hmm. he's there and it, it brings it, it brings it all home and it's a recording session. It's, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's anyone who's interested, anyone who doesn't know, um, the harder they come, Jimmy Cliff album. I get nothing for this. This is this is anyone who's interested in reggae. This this might be the best place to start. I mean, you know, uh, besides maybe some some Whaler albums. Um, I know it's must be much more nuanced and complex um, that one superstar would record a song, and it lead to a breakthrough, but what, what impact do you, did in your mind Eric Clapton covering I, uh, Bob Marley's I Shot the Sheriff have on the world of reggae? What, was that a big deal at the time when, when Clapton recorded that? Excuse me, I don't, I don't know about having a big impact on reggae music per se. On Bob Marley personally, it obviously had a massive impact because at that time in 1974, um, he had no band. He had no group. Um, Peter and Bunny had left. And the only musicians he had left were the Barrett brothers, Aston Family Man Barrett on bass, and the drummer Carlton Barrett, uh, the rhythm section. And that's all he had. Um, the Wailers with the uh, with Bob Bunny and Peter had signed a two album deal with Chris Blackwell that had expired. Catch a Fire and Burning had come out, um, but then the group had, had, um, had broken up. So Bob Marley had no record contract. Uh, he had no band. And um, the people he had worked with like brothers for 10 years weren't there. So it's, and then out of the blue, um, because he certainly didn't initiate it himself, Eric Clapton decided to, to cover one of his songs. And um, I Shot the Sheriff. Right. And it reached number one in America. Right. And so uh, a lot of people wanted to know who wrote this song. It's, it was a classic outlaw song, that, like we're used to hearing in rock music or country music, and yet it was different, right. because this was a Jamaican outlaw song. Right. And um, it's, what, it's what made a lot of people focus on Bob Marley as a songwriter, which was very important. Mm -hmm. And also, it provided him with the finances to keep the Barrett brothers on side and not have to go and do something else uh, with his life. It was the foundation of what was to come. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. What, was it a big song previously for the Whalers? Um, it was on their second album, Burning, and um, I think everyone recognized it as a good song, but um, it, uh, there were other songs on that album which were maybe more prominent, like Get Up, Stand Up. Right. So did Clapton just call up Marley one day and say, hi, Eric Clapton here, I'd like to cover your song? Or... No, it was the people at Shelter Records, um, you know, Danny Cordell mm -hmm. um, and Don Williams, and um, they recommended uh, the song <coughs> Clapton because Clapton was signed to Shelter 
um, in America. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's how he arrived at it. Mm -hmm. um, after, in the, in the midst of a career that you have of, of covering this music, mm. do you see it as a social consciousness music, a protest music, a, a, a religious music, pure enjoyment music. What, what to you, you know, and obviously it's not an either or, but what, what is the essence to you of, of reggae music? All of the above. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All of the above. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny because um, when I started uh, writing about reggae music, even though I'd grown up with it from Millie and My Boy Lollipop and blues parties, you know, um, when I was a teenager. But um, dance hall was what really excited me to write about. Because mm -hmm. in that period after Bob Marley died, um, the talk was that reggae music had died with him. Right. And the very opposite was true. And there was another out pouring of talent from Jamaica during the 80s, um, which was being uh, ignored um, and downgraded compared to the roots reggae of Tosh and, and Burning Spear and so on. So um, that's what got me interested in, in writing about it. And, uh, but actually um, the roots of that went back to Prince Buster. And when I was at school, Prince Buster was new on the scene and he had this hit in England um, called Al Capone. And it started with, um, don't call me Scarface, my name's Al Capone. <laughs> and then the scar beat would start. And um, hey, it's a gangster tune, you know? And um, that's dancehall. To me, that was dancehall. So for reggae music to go back to this bragging, right. bravado, um, hedonistic like form of music was nothing new mm -hmm. at all. And the, the whalers in their early days um, were rudies. Rudy, you know, um, they were singing about youths on the street. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it wasn't roots and culture at that time so that's always been there in the in the music the sexual in innuendos and so forth mm -hmm. um we have a style of music called lovers rock um which was tailor-made for close-up dancing mm -hmm. uh, and intimacy mm -hmm. um but at the same time you get these magnificent gestures uh, and political songs uh, from Steel Pulse and, and so many other people, um, which really capture the uh, imagination and, and stir people into taking a closer look at the world around them and what can be done about the things that they're seeing. So I think this is why I've been able to write about it for so long, because it covers so much ground. Yeah. And yeah, and writing right. for Echoes yeah. in, the, in the UK, they cover every strand of reggae music, mm -hmm. including gospel reggae and so on. So it's, it's been part of my mission as a journalist to actually try and expose and promote many different aspects of the music, not just one. It's, it's, it's funny, it, it, I hear what you, you're saying, to, to me, at least the whale is the most affecting, the, most, the, the music, that, their music that um, re, um, resonates most with me is the idealistic, you know, get up, stand up, one love, you know, the whole, you know, it's a very idealistic mm -hmm. music, really. And it also covers all those, the rude boy stuff. And, you know, it's a uh, very broad, it's a very broad genre, it's, it really is. But then at the same time, you know, they sang cover versions of What's New Pussycat and Sugar Sugar. <laughs> the version of Sugar Sugar must have been great. 
No, it sucked. Just like <laughs> the original, you know. <laughs> okay, there's you just gave me my headline. Um, <laughs> you know, it's 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 funny, John. My last question, I'm kind of at a loss for a last question because my last question is why have you written so much about reggae? And I think I think you just answered that. <laughs> yes. You know, what well, I guess the last question really is what what have we missed in terms of informing someone who loves the music, knows Bob Marley, knows Peter Tosh, doesn't know um, a whole lot more. You know, we've had a wide ranging discussion, got into a little bit of detail. You know, obviously there's a lot more there, but what's 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 really what would you say again if you were sitting in an elevator, standing in an elevator, sitting on a plane when we used to do those things, um, to someone to really tell them about the importance of this music? What's what's the bottom line? Um, I can only talk personally. What what really gets me uh, and and engages with me, but it's um. I discovered a world inhabited by musicians who genuinely sought to make the world a better place. And I've been very touched by that and continue to be very touched by that sentiment right the way through from the, from the very early 70s right up until this day. It's the music is a means of raising consciousness, of waking people up to what's possible um, if we act together, think together, respect one another, all things are possible. And with that goes an entire lifestyle, which um, if we use Bob Marley as the obvious example, you know, he, in so many of his interviews, he would talk about the importance of diet, uh, vegetarian diet, natural juices, uh, natural food, um, which is so prevalent today as a lifestyle choice. Mm -hmm. He also spoke about the need for exercise. Uh, he was always playing football, you know, of keeping fit. So it's, it's what we're eating. It's how we treat our bodies, but it's also the mind as well of taking information of, um, and also you've got to remember that especially the Rasta artists, they'd found something that they could relate to culturally and spiritually and in their lifestyle choices that gave meaning to their life. And so, they became ambassadors for not only Jamaican music, but also Rastafari, uh, which gave them even more impetus, even more strength to what they were doing. And I just find that an irresistible combination because also, although it's coming ultimately from the experiences of the black race in slavery and post-colonial struggles, that message works for everyone. Mm -hmm. And that's why reggae music, I think, has been embraced throughout the world. And people can relate to what it's saying, what it stands for, what it represents, and they want to feel a part of it. Mm -hmm. They do. And they're welcome to feel a part of it. So there's an ethos behind behind the behind the music. Um, I can't think of a better place to to stop. Um, I think you've summed it up beautifully. It's you know I love a lot of different kinds of music. I think you know the the tagline of the website is it's all good, and it is all good. But this is gooder. I mean not gooder. It's. Uh, <laughs> I'm grammatically challenged. It's um, it's 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 great because there is more there than the music. I, I was fortunate enough yesterday to do an interview about Pete Seeger, mm -hmm. and with Pete Seeger also, you know, there's more there than the the music is great. You know, 
but beyond that, there's, there's more there. And I think that's what gives reggae, a Pete Seeger, a Louis Armstrong, a lot, a lot of musicians um, staying power. And we're still talking about Bob Marley many, many years after he passed away. So I and think- we, Yeah, we opened the discussion as well, talking about Chris Blackwell. And one of the key things that he did in the early days of signing the Whalers was on Catch a Fire, he, um, he got an American rock guitarist to add a few lines to some songs on Catch a Fire. And we have to remember that at that time, which was 1972, mm -hmm. the hippie dream, the dream of the counterculture was, was beginning to fade. You know, we'd had the, Woodstock was, three years earlier and, and um, there was a lot of disenchantment that came right. on the heels uh, of Woodstock. Altamont, uh, Bad Acid, you know, um, hippie counterculture, figureheads, um, reneging on their promises or their potential or, or whatever. And so for disaffected hippies, when reggae came along with pretty much a, a similar message, an all-inclusive message. Thanks to Chris Blackwell and that innovation, um, Roots reggae music inherited a lot of that audience, which brings us right back to the freak clubs that we yeah, began. Yeah. Do you happen to remember who that guitarist was? I don't want to put you on the spot. I'm just curious. Ah, do you know, I had a feeling you were going to ask me and I've written it so many times. <laughs> um, I can't remember. Uh, uh, Perkins? Somebody Perkins? Not Carl Perkins. Sorry? Carl Perkins? No, 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 no. Anyway, I, I'll remember the minute we stopped I, talking. I know, and I'll, actually I'll edit that out. I didn't, I, cause you would think I was gonna ask the question and I was thinking it would actually be kind of a little bit rude to ask it because you were <laughs> kind enough to mention it. And I, you know, I don't remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. I don't remember if I had breakfast yesterday. So it's, you know, I'll, I'll take that out, don't, don't worry. Thanks. And then I'm gonna take a pause. John, I would like to thank you for both parts one and part two, parts one and part two of this conversation. It's been, it's been great and I really very deeply appreciate it and I thank you. Thank you, Carl. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about this because I really feel reggae music is the most relevant music on the planet right now. We look around as what's happening and it feels like the last days or something. And, and reggae music really has such a positive message. And uh, if there's one music that's going to um, make feel, people feel better about themselves and also the possibility of things in general getting better, it will be reggae music. Okay. Thank you again very much. This, this is Carl Weinshank for the Daily Music Break. Keep listening to great music. Thank you. Thank you, Carl.